Good morning. Uh, let us continue our recap about geometry. So last time, one of the main theorems that we discussed about, which are, it was not theorem, was actually uh, um, an axiom. So we learned that if we have two parallel lines, L1 and L2, if L1 is parallel to L2, and then let us say another line L is transversal, and L is transversal. Yes? If we know that, and if we know this, we can conclude something about these angles, yes? For example, this angle alpha and beta are equal based on the axiom of corresponding angles. So I can conclude that alpha is equal to beta. Any pair of co uh, corresponding angles, for example, here, if I call this theta, and if I call this one, uh, for example, gamma, then theta and gamma are also the same. So, uh, and then let me just name them. So this, let me call it, I don't know, lambda. Let me call this one sigma. Uh, let me call this one tau. Uh, and then let me call this a row, yes. So what we have is that alpha, sigma, beta, and tau are all equal. The equality of alpha and sigma is not related to this problem. It's related that they are vertical angles, and that's also important to know. And beta is equal to tau for the same reason. But why alpha is equal to beta is the content of this axiom, yes? So alpha is equal to beta is equal to, let me write it properly, alpha is equal to sigma, and then beta is equal to tau, it doesn't even need to know about these things, but if you want to connect and say that these two are also equal, then this is the content of this axiom somehow. Okay, and then we can say that the other group, so let me write and, this means and, and then I have beta and tau are equal, and gamma and rho are equal, not again related to this, axiom at all, but if they are equal, I have to use this axiom. So that was the content of the act corresponding angle uh, axiom. Uh, one thing that usually they don't address in the books, uh, I don't know why, but this is the converse of the theorem. So it means that if you have two lines which you don't know they are parallel. I will try to draw them parallel, but don't imagine they are parallel. I just give you two lines, L1 and L2. I don't know anything about if they are parallel or not, but I know that they are on the whiteboard plane, and I know that the third line actually intersects both of them. And I, for some reason, can understand that these two angles are the same. If these two angles are the same, then I can conclude these lines have to be parallel. So the content is different. Do you see here? You knew already that the lines are parallel. And then there is a transversal line, and you can conclude the equality of these angles. But now the point is that if uh, equality of two angles which, are not, which, are, which don't have the same vertex, okay? If the equality of two angles without, two, uh, without the common vertex is confirmed, you can conclude that these lines are indeed parallel. For example, in this case, if you tell me alpha is equal to beta, I can conclude that L1 is parallel to L2. Yes, so this is also extremely important. Or, for example, if I have two lines which I don't know they are parallel yet, but, for example, you tell me that this angle, uh, alpha, and this angle, uh, beta, yes, they are equal. If you tell me alpha is equal to beta, again, I can conclude that L1 and L2 are parallel, yes? Or, I, mean, I don't know, any combination that you like, for example, but you are not allowed to say that because these two are the same, these lines are parallel, no. You have to choose two angles with different vertices. So, for example, here, 
I can consider this to be alpha, uh, this to be beta. If someone tells you that alpha is equal to beta, again, if you want to, if you need it, you can conclude that L1 is parallel to L2. Yes? So in principle, if you have this Z shape, yes, if you know the, these lines are parallel, you can conclude the angles are the same and vice versa. If you know these angles are the same, you can conclude the lines are parallel. That is also important. For example, if I want to give you an example of this type, you can say that, okay, I give you two lines here, uh, L1 and L2, and then another line L, and I uh, give you this angle to be 6x uh, minus 4 degrees, and I give you this angle to be uh, 2x minus 48 degrees. The question is that, determine x so that the L1 is parallel to L2. I have drawn them in a way, of course, there is no guarantee that L1 is parallel to L2 for any choice of x. I am asking you to fine-tune this x in a way that it guarantees that L1 and L2 be parallel. That's the question. Yes? So how should I do that? So I want to ask the question, this is the question, what the value of x should be so that I can conclude that L1 is equal, to, uh, sorry, is parallel to L2. So how should I solve the problem? I want you to understand, this is not this problem, this is the converse. By the way, if you say P implies Q, yes? If a statement implies another statement, if you interchange the role of these two, the, the mathematical term for this new implication is not inverse or reversed or something, it's called converse. Yes? So I would say that Q implies P is the converse of P implies Q. That is the terminology I want you to learn. Okay. So, the, so it is not called the reverse or I don't know inverse or something, it's called the converse. And that is also important to know that if this one is true, there is no guarantee that this one is, is, is true as well. Let me just remind you again because these are important. Geometry is a good place to understand the mathematical logic as well. So here, if I say x equals to 2, then uh, if x is a real number and is equal to 2, then this implies that x to the power of 2 is equal to 4. This statement is a true statement, yes? But now what is the converse? The converse tells you that if x squared is equal to 4, then this implies that necessarily, implies means necessarily, x is equal to 2, but that is false, yes? So you see that the statement itself is true, but the converse statement turns out to be false. So that's extremely important. Whenever you prove that this one is true, you cannot say that because this is true, I take this for granted that this is true as well. You have to prove it again. That's a different story, okay? Even though it is made from the same sentences, P and Q, but there is no guarantee that because this one is true, okay, automatically this in converse is also true. So, for example, here you see that the converse is not true. Sometimes, of course, the converse is also true. So, if x is equal to 2, I can imply x to the power of 3 is 8. This is true. And if x to the power of 3 is equal to 8, I can also conclude x is equal to 2. That one is also true. Yes? So then what you can write, instead of writing it two, with two, uh, two uh, times, you can write x equals to 2, and then you put a double-sided arrow, x to the power of 3 is equal to 8. And then, so you read this, if x is 2, then x to the 3 is 8. This means that if x to the 3 is 8, then x is equal to 2. But if you want to read this, you read x equals to 2, this is red if and only if 
which in mathematical texts is abbreviated as IFF. So that's not a misprint. If you see something like that in a mathematical text, it doesn't mean that it's a misprint. It is sitting instead of if and only if. Okay. So this is red x equals to 2 if and only if x to the power of 3 is equal to 8. So this means that the, in mathematical term, there is no difference between this statement and that statement. They are completely equivalent. And of course, which one is easier to work with? Of course, this is easier to work with rather than this one, and that is good to understand. Okay, so this is what here, more or less, I am talking about the converse. So this means that if alpha is equal to beta, I can conclude that L1 is parallel to L2. Then I interchange these two, I get the converse. If L1 is parallel to L2, I can conclude alpha is equal to beta. The, the second one that I mentioned was the axiom. This one is the converse of that axiom. Okay, so let us go back there. So what should X be so that it guarantees that L1 and L2 are parallel? So if, they, if L1 and L2 should be parallel, then you should have a correct Z shape, yes? So, but you see, if I want to have my Z shape complete, this is the best that I can think about. This is an ugly Z, yes? Because they are not parallel, but I want to force them to be parallel. So it means that I have to guarantee that this angle is equal to this angle. Do you agree? If I can guarantee that these two angles are the same, then because of this converse theorem, I can even conclude that L1 is parallel to L2. First of all, is that understandable? Yes. Okay. But this angle is somehow given to me, 6x minus 4 degrees, but this angle is not given to me yet. Then I want to force them to be equal. But what can I write for this part? Okay, what can you tell me? 180 minus... Minus this guy, minus. yes. So this becomes 180 minus 2x minus 48... So, sorry, let me write put the degree on top. So I have to write 180 minus this. Whatever this is, is this angle. Yes? So let me simplify this algebraically. So it means that I open this pair of brackets. It becomes 180 minus 2x, but minus minus is plus 48 degrees. And then I simplify it a little bit more. 48 and this one 228, and then minus 2x degrees. Okay, so now I want to find this x so that this z shape is a really nice z. It means that they have to be parallel, so they have to be equal. So this means that I come up with this idea that 6x minus 4, whatever that one is, it should be equal to 228 minus 2x. Yes? And then I move that, that just an algebraic equation, so very simple one. So I move 2x to the other side, it becomes 8x. I move 4 to the other side, uh, 232. Yes? And I divide everything by 8 and try to simplify. So if I simplify by 4, uh, 58, 2, 29. 8, Yes? Okay. So that is 29. That is one uh, application of the converse. So I, it's extremely important to understand that this theorem, of course, this axiom work in both ways. Yes? If you know that the lines are parallel, you can conclude that the some of these angles, as you know, they are equal. On the other hand, if you know that two angles whose vertices are not the same or equal, you can conclude that the lines are parallel. Yes? That is also one uh, thing that I want you to know. Okay, but now let us go to a little bit more uh, interesting problem. Of course, this is also very, very famous. Uh, so, you know that if you have a triangle, ABC, I have three, these are AC, AB, AC, and BC are called sides, yes? And then, of course, I have three angles, three angles and three sides, yes? These angles, if you want to specify them as a, a little bit 
uh, if you want to emphasize what type of angle you are talking about, you can talk about interior angles. Yes. So it means that they are angles of the triangle, but lie inside the triangle. Yes. Because we can also continue, or actually, this is the in, uh, English word we use, extend a line, for example, from this vertex, and then you can talk about this angle as well. This angle is called an exterior angle. Okay? An exterior angle adjacent to this interior angle. It is next, sitting next to this interior angle. I can, I can extend this one, for example, and talk about this exterior angle. That is also an exterior angle for the triangle, but ne sitting next to A. So we can say exterior angle corresponding to the interior angle A. And I can also extend this one and talk about this exterior angle. Of course, in, on every vertex you can consider two exterior angles, but one of them is enough. But for example, if you want to, uh, you can do this. You can extend this one and talk about this exterior angle. But you see that these two exterior angles are exactly equal because they become vertical angles. So it, usually we don't talk about both of them. We just talk about one of them in, in, in each vertex. So this is, these are the terminologies that I want you to know. Okay, what can we say about the interior angles? Probably you already know it from even uh, going to school down, and that is uh, the sum of the interior angles of any triangle is what? 180 degrees. Okay, so let us see why this is true. Okay, so let us have just one triangle. I choose one triangle randomly, ABC. My claim is that if I add this angle to that angle, let me give them names, okay? Let me write little... Little a is usually denoted, so let me just move alpha here, beta, and go. Okay? So my claim is that if I add these angles, it's always 180 degrees, regardless of how I draw the triangle. So this is important. When I want to argue about it, every line that I write, I draw a picture for understanding it better. But what I write on the board as, in my, as my argument should be independent of the details of the shape. If it depends to that particular shape, it means that this has something to do with that particular triangle. But we want to prove it for every triangle, yes? So be careful. Of course, you have to draw a shape for yourself to understand the problem better. But this is important to check that what you write is independent of that particular shape that you have drawn if you want to prove it something in general. Okay, let us see why this is true. I don't know how many of you have seen this before. Why the alpha plus beta plus gamma is indeed 180 degrees? Of course, in geometry, we cannot start with empty hand. And our hands are not empty now, we have that axiom. So based on that axiom, that is a consequence of that axiom and another axiom which was the parallel axiom. So the parallel axiom tells me that if I want to, I can take this point which is outside this line and draw one unique line which is parallel to BC. So let me just draw that line. So you might say that, okay, how should I do it? How, should, how can I be sure that there's such a line exists? I would say that parallel axiom tells me this, there exists such a line. You might say why parallel axiom is true. We cannot say if it is true or not. We are, we are investigating. We are exploring the consequences of those axioms. So what I'm saying is that if you, ad, if you accept that parallel axiom is true, and if you accept the corresponding angle, equality of corresponding angles are also true, then you have to accept that the sum of the interior angles of any triangle is 180 degrees. Of course, if it turns out that one of those axioms are false, 
then of course this will also uh, be violated. Yes, that's what I'm saying. You want to? I want you to understand. I am proving this based on those two axioms. So we are not starting with empty hand. Yes, we have accepted two sentences, two statements to be true, and then we are telling you if you tell me those are true, I can show that this is also always true. Is that clear? So what this is the logic. Okay, so I said that, okay, because of the parallaxium, I can draw this line that passes through A and is parallel to BC, so I use the parallaxium. But now I can use that con uh, corresponding uh, angle axiom. How can I do that? I hope that you agree with me that this angle, so let me call it, uh, I don't know, theta, is equal to beta. Yes? Because if this is parallel to this one, you can just extend it in your head to visualize it better. And then you can give the role of your transversal to this line. Yes? Just for better imagining things. And then I hope that you agree because this is your Z shape now. Yes? And this is a real Z because this is parallel to this one. So this means theta is equal to beta. Yes, so this means that theta is equal to beta. I can uh, change the idea of the, I can change the role of the transversal. I can uh, still consider these two lines to be parallel, but this time I give the role of the transversal to this line. Yes, and then again you see that you have an inverse Z shape. Yes, so this means that if I call this angle, for example, lambda, this lambda is equal to this gap. Yes? So lambda is equal to gap. <laughs> yes? And now let me just add these two. It becomes theta plus lambda is equal to beta plus gamma. I can add alpha to both sides. So it becomes alpha plus theta plus gamma is equal to alpha plus beta plus gamma. Yes? So I confirm this using this parallel axiom uh, theorem and then I confirm the same thing for this one and I add it. This is algebra. If two numbers are equal pairwise, I can add these two. It becomes equal if I add these two. And then when I have equality of these two, I can conclude that if I add alpha to this and to that, the results will be the same. Yes? And now look, what is this angle? This I know. So this is alpha, this is theta, and this is gamma. I am adding them. So what do I get? I get this. So the left hand side is 180 for sure. But the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. So the right hand side should also be 180. That is the reason. So you see, if you, I want you to understand, there are two axioms involved in this problem. The truth of parallel axiom, we accepted that. The truth of uh, equal angles for the equal corresponding angles are also involved in that. Then any triangle have this problem. Yes. Uh, okay. Any questions here? Okay. So this is something you know and you can use. For example, by the way, how many type of triangles we have? Let us also discuss about the English words for them. So if you have, so there are two. I, there are some terminologies I want you to learn. If all the angles are acute angle, you say that this is an acute triangle. So if, if you read this in the literature that an acute triangle, it means that I have a triangle whose angles are all acute angles. Yes? But sometimes you see an obtuse triangle. What does it mean? What do you think it means if I say an obtuse triangle? You cannot say that a triangle whose all angles are obtuse. This cannot be. That's, this cannot happen. Yes, obtuse, an ang obtuse angle is an angle larger than 90. So if three of them is supposed to be larger than 90, then the sum of them should be larger than 270 degrees. But we know that the sum of them should be exactly equal to 180. So an obtuse triangle means with one, exactly one obtuse angle. 
because you cannot even have two obtuse angles yes even if you have two angles which are greater than 90 degrees the contribution from them is larger than 180 nothing is left for the poor third one yes so this means that an obtuse triangle means a triangle with exactly one obtuse angle so this is one categorizing one way of categorizing triangles another one uh, we can talk about a scaling triangle scaling triangle means that I have a triangle with different sides with different side length yes so there are the sizes of sides are all different that's called scaling yes for example more or less this triangle that I have drawn here yeah it's good representative for that might be this is a better one so I can draw this a little bit longer and then this one, yes something like that. that's called a scaling triangle but if two sides are equal then that is called an isosceles triangle yes so if two sides are exactly equal so I will have isosceles uh, I always isosceles yes yes isosceles triangle so it means that I have I have at least two sides equal not exactly two sides that's called isosceles triangle something like this yes a b c and then in that case this vertex is called the apex yes so these are the words it is good to know so isosceles triangle is a triangle whose two sides are equal and then in that case this vertex is called the apex and then we have equilateral triangle so let me just write the word equilateral and this means that all the sides are equal yes so all the sides are equal of course this means that these sides are equal. that's called equilateral of course if you have equilateral triangle it's automatically isosceles as well but it might happen that you have an isosceles triangle but not equilateral triangle and there's another one uh, is called right angle triangle right angle right angle triangle and of course you are familiar with this one it means that you have exactly one uh, right angle in your triangle yes so the only terminology that you need to know about the right angled uh, triangle is that the side opposite to this 90 degree angle is called the hypotenuse yes that is the hypotenuse so you know geometry involves a lot of words you need to know okay okay and another one uh, that I want you to know are the, some some uh, terminology related to any triangle so if I have a triangle if I draw a line from a vertex perpendicular to the opposite side yes this is called altitude So this AH is the altitude and the length of the AH is called the height but I have seen some books use them interchangeably they say height they mean altitude or the other way around but in principle height is the length of an altitude yes that is called height and altitude so this is I want you to know so every triangle has how many altitudes and three three corresponding to each vertex let us just try to understand these things a little bit because that's a recap I want to finish these things but it, they are important so here for example uh, another height or altitude to be correct is this one another height is this one and there is an important theorem that you don't study and then the, the next one will also pass through this exact point okay uh, 
So the third one also passes through this point. And then this is a terminology that's good to know. If there are three more than two lines passing through the same point, then those lines are called concurrent. Concurrent lines means the lines that are actually passing through one single point. But of course, this is not trivial at all, that the third one will definitely pass exactly from that point. But if you are interested, you can see the videos on, for the Olympia that we have. So we have proven that this is indeed the case. So this is something for a scaling triangle. But let us go to another triangle, a right angle triangle. So can you tell me what are the altitudes for a right angle triangle? So if I have this one, so what are the what are the altitudes? A, B, A, C. Yes, two of them are already sides. Yes, so this is not only a side, but also the altitude. This is also the altitude. The third one is this one. So this one is the altitude, altitude, altitude. Yes, it doesn't mean that they are equal, but I mean these three line segments are the altitudes for a, a right angle triangle and then something that i want you to know is what happens if i have an obtuse triangle that's it then you have to know the definition so if i have an obtuse triangle yes a b c this is something that probably needs a little bit of explanation so if i want to draw the altitudes of this triangle one of them is clear this is one of them but for the other one, if I want to draw perpendicular line, I cannot draw it inside. Because that not, will not be perpendicular. So I, you have to extend this in your head and draw this one. And you need to know that you have to stop here by definition. This one is an altitude. This is the altitude which corresponds to vertex C and the side AB. And if I want to draw the height or the altitude for B, what should I do? I have to extend this one in my head and then draw this perpendicular line. So this height, this altitude is the altitude for B corresponding to side AC and this is the altitude for C corresponding side AC. And then of course you might say where this point lies now, this point you cannot see them but if you are patient and continue them, they will pass through the same point. Okay. Uh, but this, this is not part of your lesson. But th this is part of your lesson to be able to understand the altitudes of an up to, up to triangle. Okay. There is nothing very important about altitudes at the level of the book that you need to know. And then we go to the next thing. And that is called a median. Okay. So a median. So this is the word. A median is... A line that uh, uh, joins one vertex to the midpoint of the opposite side so it means that I find the midpoint so for example let me call it M this length is equal to this length and then I join a to oops I join a to M okay I join a to M this is called one a median median of vertex A corresponding to side BC. And then again, how many medians do I have? Three medians. And the interesting thing is that this situation also happens for medians. Yes. So it means that I take another median here, another median here. It is not at all trivial that the medians passes through the same point. But yes, they passes through the same. They pass through the same point. So this is the another thing that you need to know. Another one is of course angled bisector. So every triangle has three angled bisectors. Yes, angled bisector. So this means that if I have a triangle ABC, what can I do? I can divide this angle into two equal pieces and then don't continue. When you say angle bisector of a triangle, you, that is a line segment. Do you remember yesterday we talked about angle bisector of an angle that was a ray. So it continues forever, yes? 
because the angle continues forever from one side. But when you say angle bisected of a triangle, by definition, you have to stop there, yes? For example, if I call it D. So this angle alpha is equal to this angle alpha. That's an angle bisector. And then three of them are there, and then again, the nice thing is that all of them again are concurrent. They pass through the same point, yes? So this means that if I draw this one, oops, it doesn't look like angle bisector. So something like this. So this is beta, this is beta. And the next one, the third one, will definitely pass us through exactly the same point. This gives me gamma and gamma, yes? So angle bisectors, we have three of them, and all of them are concurrent. And finally, we have perpendicular bisectors. Perpendicular bisectors are not line segments, they are lines. And this means that... means that we have some scenario like this. So if I have a triangle given to you, you find the midpoint of a, of a side and then draw a perpendicular line, not line segment. So it continues forever for both sides. This is perpendicular bisector. It's perpendicular and bisects the side. Yes, yeah? so this length is equal to this. This is one of the perpendicular bisectors of the triangle. And for any triangle, I can imagine three of them, okay? So another one I can do from here. Yes? So I don't want to continue not to mix it up with the picture, but it continues forever. And the good point is that if you draw the third one, it also passes through the same point. So that's also a concurrent uh, triple. So this means that this side is equal to that side, that side is equal to that. So that length is equal to that length. So that is the perpendicular bisector. So these are uh, three lines not limited to the triangle. They continue forever. They are not line segments. They are lines. So these are the terminologies I want you to know about any triangle. Yes? Uh, so now, one thing that I want you to know, I think we already talked about this in Math 1C, and that is the relation between exterior angle and the interior angles. So do you remember this something like this? This setup should be familiar to your eyes, yes? If I have this, A, B, C, and for example, let me concentrate on this exterior angle. Let me call it alpha. This is the exterior angle corresponding to C this is always true that this is equal to the sum of two interior angles which are not adjacent to alpha. Yes? So alpha has an interior angle which is next to it. Forget about C. There are two more. This one and that one. And you add these two, it becomes this number. Okay? So let us see why. This is important to understand. So let me call this one, I don't know, beta and go. So, and then I can give this one also a name, theta. We learned that beta plus gamma plus theta is the sum of interior angles of this triangle. It has to be 180 degrees. Yes? And then what happens? Alpha plus theta is also 180 degrees because this becomes a straight angle. And then because both of them are equal to 180, I can conclude that these two are equal. And then what can I do? I can move theta from the right to the left, make it negative, it will cancel this one, and I will get the result. So alpha is equal to beta plus gamma. So these things, if you want to use, you don't need to prove them. You can use them in the exam. You don't need to justify this all the time. Okay, geometry is mainly solving problems, you know, because these ideas are simple, but in practice it might be hard to implement them properly. Okay, so one thing that I want to mention now about the angles is that if I have more than three sides, for example, by the way, if you have 
a shape with many sides, or I mean more than three sides, even three sides, they are, they are under the title of the name polygons. Polygon, yes? A polygon is a shape with more than three, three or more than three sides. So a triangle is already a polygon. A square is a polygon. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you want to emphasize, you can say n-gon. N-gon means a polygon with n sides. So, for example, a square is a four-gon. Yes? A rhombus is a four-gon, or etc. Okay, so you can talk about uh, n-gon, polygon. And you can also talk about a regular polygon. A regular polygon is a polygon that holds, whose sides are all equal. That's called a regular polygon. Yes. For example, a square is a regular foregone. Yes. Because the sides are equal. Even rhombus. No, rhombus, by the way, that was my mistake. That's clear. Rhombus is not a, a regular polygon because the angles are not the same in general. So you know that this is the rhombus, yes. In a rhombus, the sides are all equal. Of course, this angle is equal to that angle, but there is no guarantee that these two angles are also equal to that. So that is not a regular, even though the sides are equal. So I have to con I have to correct myself. A regular polygon is a polygon that the sides and the angles are all the same. Yes. So, uh, what is the only fo regular foregone? Square. It's a square. Yes. Uh, okay, but we can increase the sides, and then we want to ask the question, is there any formula that I can find about the sum of the interior angles, not only for a triangle, but for any n gone? Yes, and the answer is yes, let us try to discover that. So let us try to do some exploration here. First of all, let me start with the... By the way, there is another name. There are many, many names that you need to learn, okay? So this is, a, of course, a polygon with four sides, but there is a, a special name for it. That's called a quadrilateral, yes? A quadrilateral means... A foregone. You can say a foregone, but that's not very common. The, the common name is quadrilateral. Yes? So assume that I have a quadrilateral. And I want to sum, I want to add the sizes of the angles. For the triangle, we learn that this is 180. But let us see what happens for a quadrilateral. So this is alpha. This is beta, this is gamma, and this is theta. I want to answer this question, what is this sum? Okay, so of course I think you know the answer. What is the answer, by the way? No, yes. 200 degrees. No. 360 degrees. It is 360 degrees, but let us explore why. So how can I justify that, the sum of these four angles? regardless of the details of my quadrilateral, is always 360 degrees. This is a number that I want you to memorize. So how can I prove that? Yes? So you can draw a line between A and alpha and gamma. There is a name for that line. What's the, the name? Diagonal. diagonal. Yes, so I draw a diagonal. So you told me to draw a diagonal from here to here. Then, alpha becomes two pieces, not necessarily equal, so let me call it alpha and al alpha 1 and alpha 2, and gamma is partitioned into two parts, not necessarily equal, so let me call them gamma 1 and gamma 2. Yes? But now, if you consider the left triangle, yes, what happens? We know that alpha 1 plus theta plus gamma 1 is 180 degrees, because they are interior angles of a triangle, yes? And I can do the same thing for the other one. So this beta plus alpha, let me write them, yeah. alpha 2 plus beta plus gamma 2 is also 180 degrees, 
because they are interior angles of another triangle, this triangle. Okay? And then I add them side by side, yes? So alpha 1 plus alpha 2, I can group them. Beta plus theta, and then gamma 1 plus gamma 2, I can group them. On the right-hand side, this becomes 360 degrees. Yes? And now if I ask you what is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 in this shape, what is that? This is the original alpha. This becomes alpha, beta plus theta, I just copy and paste, and gamma 1 plus gamma 2 is exactly gamma, and that is 360 degrees. So this is also good to know. Now let me increase the number of sides from 4 to 5. Okay, so for example, by the way, there is another name for this one. What is that? It's a pentagon, yes? If I have five sides. One, two, three, four, and I think this is five. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five. Yes. Of course, it is not a regular pentagon, but it is a pentagon. Okay, so uh, I want to find the sum of these angles. Alpha, beta, gamma, theta, and lambda. But the question is that I want to add them to see what I can get. So this time, what should I do? I have to draw two diagonals, yes? For example, if you want, I can take this one and then draw this diagonal and this diagonal. So the strategy becomes clear. I start partitioning my end goal to a number of triangles, yes? And then this, I have three alphas now. Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. And then I have gamma 1, gamma 2. Then I have theta 1, theta 2. Then I have log. Then I have three triangles, yes? So I can write alpha 1 plus beta plus gamma 1 is 180. And then I have alpha 2 plus gamma 2 uh, plus uh, theta 1 is equal to 180. And I have alpha 3 plus lambda plus theta 2 is 180, yes? And then I start adding them up. But let me just add them in a way that you can see. So if I add these three numbers, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 becomes my original alpha. Beta and then lambda. Okay, so I consider these. But then you see that gamma 1 and gamma 2 are added. But gamma 1 added to gamma 2 is the original gamma. And theta 1 plus theta 2 is the original theta. But I have to add 3 180 degrees, so it becomes 504 degrees. Well, 540 degrees. Okay? But now, let us try to understand what will happen if you just give me an n gone. Can I discover a formula for that so that I don't have to do it every time? Okay? So I did it for triangle in a different way, by the parallaxium and things like that. But for quadrilateral and pentagon, I just partitioned my shape into a number of triangles and I use that theorem over and over again. But now, let us try to understand what will happen if I have six sides, if I have seven sides. I am lazy, I cannot do it all the time from scratch. Let us find a formula once for all, okay? So how can I do that? So can you tell me what to do? How can I imagine this? So if I have a, a, an end gone, it means that, for example, this is vertex, one vertex, second, third, fourth. I don't know. I cannot draw an end gone uh, because it doesn't mean anything here, end. But I can imagine like this. I don't know. So it means continues, and then finally I go back. So A1, A2. A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, this becomes AN, if I continue, okay? So, uh, but how should I uh, calculate the sum of the angles? And if you don't mind, let me write A1, uh, angle A1 plus angle AN. I want to find the formula for this. Angle A1, I mean this angle, interior angle. 
Okay, how should I do that? Again, the strategy is clear. I have to partition this uh, end gone to uh, a number of rectangles. But the point is that how many rectangles? Because the number of rectangles are important. You see, here I had two rectangles. Then on the right hand side, I added two 180 degrees. Then I partitioned this pentagon into three triangles. And then I have three 180s to add. If I have n gone, and I want to do the same strategy, for example, I start from A1, and I don't know, connect it to A3, connect it to A4, connect it to A5, A6, A7, and of course I will continue dot dot dot. How many triangles you will see at the end? N minus 2. Yes, is that understandable? So that is N minus 2 triangles. Why is that? Uh, because I take A1 and connect it to every point, except two points, except the one, the one A2, except A2 and A2N, because if I connect them, then they are already connected, and that's a side. It doesn't produce me any triangles. But except for that, uh, I uh, connect it to every other side. So how many, how many vertices are left for me? Uh, so yes. N minus two triangles, yes, except these two. So if you count the number of triangles, is N minus two triangles. And then you really don't need to calculate anything because the reasoning is like that. So if you continue, what is the question mark then? You get N minus two triangles. Each triangle has angle, uh, the sum of the internal angles to be this. So that is good to remember, yes? So this formula, 180, people usually write it the other way around multiplied by n. This is the formula, the sum of the interior angles of a pentagon. Oh, sorry, of an n gon. Of an n gon. Uh, does this work also for triangle? Yes, because for triangle, n is how much? Three. three. And if you put three here, three minus two, one, one times 180. 180, that's correct. For a quadrilateral, n is four. If you put it here, it becomes 360. And for the other one, that's also true. Yes? Okay, but that is a good thing to know. Another thing is, uh, I wanted to know, is the sum of the exterior angles of a triangle. If you have A, B, C. Okay, so for example, let me call this one alpha. And then extend this. Let me call this one beta. And let me call this one gamma. So what happens if I start adding the exterior angles? So what is alpha plus beta plus gamma? So how can I do that? Uh, so alpha plus beta plus gamma is my question. I want to see that if I can say something concrete about the sum of the exterior angles, not interior. Okay, what, is, what can I do? Instead of alpha, I can write 180 minus, uh, let me write u, v, and w. Okay? So I can write 180 minus u. Instead of beta, I can write 180 minus v, and instead of gamma, I can write 180 minus w. Yes? But this is algebra now. You have to be able to simplify things, and it's very simple. I have three 180s added together, so it becomes 540 degrees. But minus u, minus v, minus w, I can factor a minus sign out and write u plus v plus w. Yes? But then suddenly what happens, u plus v plus w, is the sum of the interior angles of my original triangle. So it is 180 degrees. So this becomes 540 minus 180 degrees, yes? And the answer becomes how much? 360 degrees. Okay, something that was not very, uh, that is not very uh, intuitively clear, here you see that when I increase when I increase the number of sides, the number, the, the value, uh, the sum of the interior angles actually changes. It becomes bigger and bigger. 
Yes? But let us see what will happen for the sum of the exterior angles. For example, let me just check this only for a quadrilateral for the time being. What do you expect? If I start adding the exterior angles of a quadrilateral, how much will it be? I think it will be the same or less. The same or less. Let us check. Any other opinions? On this calculation, you should be able to do it uh, easily. So you draw a random quadrilateral So, for example, let me just draw a random quadrilateral here, A, B, C, D, okay? So now I extend this one, for example, let me call this one alpha, I extend this one, let me call it beta, I extend this one, let me call it gamma, and I finally extend this one, let me call it theta. My question is that what is alpha plus beta plus gamma plus theta in this setup? This is the sum of the exterior angles for a quadrilateral. Okay, what can I do? Let me just give them u, v, w, and x. Again, my question is alpha plus beta plus gamma plus theta. This is my question mark. But instead of alpha, I can write 180 again minus u. Yes? I can, instead of beta, I can write what? 180 minus v. Instead of gamma, I can write 180 minus w. And instead of, uh, instead of theta, I can write 180 minus x. Yes? But again, the same story, I have 180s to be added, but how many of them are there? Four of them. Four times 180 is 720. And then minus, I factor a minus sign out, minus u becomes u, minus v becomes positive v, positive w, and positive x. But you already know this answer, the answer to this sum. Because u, v, w, and x is the sum of the interior angles of a quadrilateral, which we still have on the board. It is 360 degrees, yes? So your prediction for this was correct. It is exactly, again, 360 degrees. So the sum of the exterior angles, even for a quadrilateral, is the same number. But if I check the interior, the sum of the interior angles, it is ex ex uh, uh, increasing. What do you think about the pentagon? This is very interesting. It is the same for all n gons. And we want to prove that. Yes. So it doesn't matter how many sides you have. If you start adding the interior angles, of course the interior angle, the sum of the interior angles grow. Yes, grows. Yes. But if I want to consider the interior angles, it does not grow. Okay. So what I can do, if I want to understand this, Okay, so let us understand this, but of course the drawing the picture might be a little bit hard. So I, but I, what I can do, I can draw the, I can clean these blue lines, I don't need them anymore. Uh, but I want to do the same thing more or less here. Okay, so let us do like this. The interior one, let me call it A1. The exterior one, let me call it alpha one. Yes? And then I can do the same thing for all these vertices. Yes? So uh, what can I do? I can find, I want to find the sum of the exterior ones. So it means alpha 1 plus alpha 2. I want to find this sum up to alpha n. This is my question mark for this case. Yes? 
And now what I can do, instead of alpha 1, I hope that you agree that I can write 180 minus A1. Yes? Instead of alpha 2, I can do the same story. 180 minus A2, and then I can continue until the very last one. 180 degrees minus A sub n. Understandable or not? That's the same strategy, but here I have n terms. So how many 180s will appear at the end? How many? How many? No, how many 180 appears here? N of them, yes? So it becomes 180 times N. Yes? I am adding the same number N times. But I have a negative sign here, a negative sign here, a negative sign there. As before, I factor the negative sign out. It becomes A1 plus A2 up to AN. Yes? But we already answered this part. What was this part? It is the sum of all interior angles, which is still on the board. <coughs> the sum of the interior angles has this formula. So instead of that, I would put this one. So it becomes 180 degrees N minus 180 degrees N minus 2. Yes? And then I can multiply 180 in, so it becomes 180 degrees N minus 180 degrees N but minus 180 mi multiplied by minus 2, it becomes positive 360. And then suddenly you see that whatever this is, is cancelled with that. And then what is left is again 360 degrees. So that's a very nice result. So it means that if you increase the number of the sides of an n gon, the sum of the interior angles becomes larger and larger but the sum of the exterior angles remain fixed and that is 360 degrees yes understandable uh, another thing that i just want to mention and then the lesson is finished now is that that is called the triangle inequality but I just we don't prove it if you want to see the proof you can see my videos on this Olympiad lessons but uh, here I want you to know the triangle inequality The triangle inequality tells you that if you have any triangle, any triangle, it doesn't matter what type of triangle, the sum of two sides, the sum of the lengths of two sides is always larger than the length of the third side. Okay, so that's very simple. By the way, that's a very nice convention. If you have a triangle like this, the length of the opposite side of A is denoted by little a, the length of the side of opposite to uh, this B is little b, and then this one little c. So the triangle inequality tells you that A plus B is always larger than C. A plus C is always larger than B, and uh, B plus C is always larger than A. So if you have any triangle, the sum of the lengths of two sides is always larger uh, than the third side. I think it was famous that people back then call it donkey theorem. Now, I don't know. In Persian uh, culture, donkey is the symbol of stupidity. I don't know if that's also true in Swedish culture or not. But they say that, okay, if you have a donkey here, and if that's the food for the donkey, donkey knows that go straight forward. It's shorter than going that way. Yes. If donkey knows about that, let alone humans, yes? So that, but of course that's not a mathematical argument, that is more or less a philosophical argument based on the philosophy at that time, probably. Yes. Okay, uh, I don't want to continue, but there are many problems you have to solve to improve your skills. And by the way, some of the problems in the book are quite good, and some of, some of them are hard actually. I want to uh, start practicing on them. 
before we go to the next lesson, which is probably completely new. Okay? Uh, so I want to update the Google Classroom so that we can start working on those problems. Thank you. Any questions, by the way? Thank you.